Hello and welcome to the Archimedes stage. Next up, we have Louis Van Quende, and he'll be talking about Bitcoin, coining the future of money. And he's a 17-year-old hacker and entrepreneur who's the f who founded Asterix and co-founded Cardui. So put your hands together for Louis Van Quende. Thank you. So um, as Priscilla said, um, I'm a hacker entrepreneur that started working with free software uh, at age 12. And now um, I'm creating like a Bitcoin startup because I think Bitcoin is, uh, is a space for disruption. It's like, you know, uh, software has been disrupted and now it's time for the uh, financial system to be disrupted. So, so my talk of today will be about uh, how you can create apps with Bitcoin and also what's the future of Bitcoin um, and what's the adoption that we com Bitcoin will, will have in the next years. So I will start talking about money. What's money? So uh, money basically is something that is used to exchange products and services in society. Um, well, first of all, gold was used because of its scarcity. Uh, that it was not easy to get gold. And then uh, the fiduciary money was born. And governments started to create uh, titles or credits. Um, that was the, the money itself uh, in exchange of gold. So, so the government gave you like uh, bills, and that bills has an equivalent in gold. So that was the the value that, mon that the money had that you could exchange your money, your bills for gold. But then President Nixon. Uh, converted fiduciary money into fiat money that is based on debt. It's like, uh, it's not exactly, it, it hasn't has uh, value because it's something that doesn't exist. That was debt. Debt is something that has not been paid. It's th something that doesn't really exist. So money started to be like something without real value. Um, and then banks started to control the currency because banks are the ones that uh, give credits and they buy debt. And then, you know, uh, in some years ago, in 2008, uh, everything started to fail, uh, you know, uh, with the Prime crisis in the United States and, and, you know, banks kind of uh, have problems and, you know, the crisis that, for example, in Spain is huge and in other uh, countries of the planet. So um, Bitcoin was born too in 2008 uh, it was created by an anonymous person uh, that has a nickname of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. So, somebody says that uh, Satoshi is uh, Japanese, uh, or people say that he is uh, Irish. I mean, we don't know uh, his identity, but we know that he started working some years ago on what was the uh, world's first peer-to-peer -peer currency. So Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer currency that is today secure. It's based on, you know, on cryptography that is used by banks, for example. Um, you can be your own bank because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So uh, in my laptop, I can run Bitcoin, and you your laptop can run Bitcoin as well, and you know, mobile phones. So every node forms part of the network. But no one has the total control. There is no bank. There is no central bank that says what's right and what's wrong. You have your money in your pocket, in your mobile phone, uh, in your laptop, and every node verifies the transactions that happen in the network. If I pay someone, for example, uh, in a traditional system, the bank would verify that I paid someone. But in Bitcoin, there is the mess of computers, the nodes, there are the nodes that verify that I made the transaction, that I made that payment. So Bitcoin also works everywhere. It's free software. There are many parts of Bitcoin in many programming languages. Um, you can run Bitcoin, as I said, in your Android smartphone, for example, or in Linux, Windows, Mac OS, in every operating system because it's totally free software. Um, and also, uh, we have the problem with the traditional economy that we can't like divide money. We can't uh, split a bill. Well, w we can, but but uh, it will be not accepted by, by the stores and so on. With Bitcoin, there is not that problem because you can uh, divide your money. There is divisible, so you can have like uh, 0.801 Bitcoin. So, uh, and also, Bitcoins are limited to 21 millions. Um, 
that's kind of a problem, but uh, actually, I think it is better than having a lot of debt like we have nowadays. Uh, for example, we know the United States of, um, of America will never pay uh, their debt or the countries. They have just too much debt because we live in a system that is based on debt. It's fiat money. And that's the problem. So, for example, uh, well, Bitcoin, uh, you can work with Bitcoin having a Bitcoin wallet. A Bitcoin wallet is like uh, a traditional wallet, but it's totally digital. You have it in your um, computer. You can run it with your computer, uh, with your uh, user interface. Uh, with the user interface, you can pay someone, you can send money, you can receive money. You can also generate new addresses because uh, Bitcoin works with uh, addresses. So you have like an alphanumeric, that I think is a 34 digit address. So if I give my address to someone here, you can pay me just sending Bitcoins to that address. And I can generate a lot of address because uh, there is like, you know, being an alphanumeric string of 34 characters that are like billions or trillions of possible addresses. Um, and each wallet has some private key, like a private key. So you, so you when you uh, like uh, access your wallet, you need your public key, that is your address, and your private key. There is like your password for accessing your wallet. Everything that, that, has, uh, that you have in the Bitcoin wallet is stored in a file that is wallet.dat. It's just a database in a file that contains every single transaction you have done with your Bitcoin wallet, uh, your addresses, uh, the money you have, etc. Um, but you can't hack that. I mean, you can't just uh, edit the file and add you more Bitcoins because it is verified by the whole network that you have that Bitcoins. So when I make a transaction, uh, it is registered there in the file, but also it is registered on all the nodes that verify that I have made that transaction. So you cannot fake money with Bitcoin. And if you lose your, your wallet at that, or your wallet for accident, for, for example, having your private key, you can unlock it. So uh, just with a string, you can back up your wallet. Just copy in a single string. And you can have all your money safe, just with one string. So um, entering more in the, in the development process of, of creating apps with Bitcoin, uh, there is a diamond that is Bitcoin. A diamond is like a process that is always executing. So when creating APIs, for example, I work with Bitcoin or applications that work with Bitcoin, you need to interact with the Bitcoin wallet. And Bitcoin is the diamond that implements uh, the RPC calls so you can uh, like access the Bitcoin API. You can send transactions with Bitcoin, you can receive money with Bitcoin, generate new addresses, etc. And you need just to, to go to Bitcoin.org and download the Bitcoin client. And it comes with Bitcoin, with a diamond you need to start developing for Bitcoin, on where Bitcoin. So uh, when you create a wallet or, or when you uh, want to start developing for Bitcoin, you need to edit a config file that looks like that. It's Bitcoin.conf. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, review the parameters you can set in this config file. For example, the first one, testnet, uh, is like a sandbox. For example, you know, uh, PayPal has a sandbox. So if you are uh, developing an application with PayPal that admits uh, PayPal payments, for example, you can enter the sandbox and you can like uh, make test payments so you are not losing money while testing. So this is the same with Bitcoin. You can create, uh, you can run your Bitcoin wallet as a testnet. So every single Bitcoin you have uh, has no real value. It's just a test Bitcoin. Uh, that runs on a testnet on a sandbox, but it's very interesting while you are while, while you are like developing for Bitcoin. Then we have the other parameters that specify what nodes we want to connect to, because as I said, Bitcoin is a mess of computers. It's a peer-to-peer, -peer, a distributed program. So the add node parameter specifies to what nodes we want to connect. So uh, if we have a very uh, large application, for example. We will have some nodes that are very fast. So we can connect to those nodes and verify our transactions very fast. A normal transaction uh, done in Bitcoin is uh, like uh, 10 minutes to verify. Well, it can vary a lot, but it's like 10 minutes. So if we need to reduce the time to two minutes or one minute, for example, we would add there a lot of nodes that are really fast. 
Uh, then we have the connect parameter that is like the add node, but it is like restrictive. We only want to connect to a couple nodes or some nodes. The add node adds a node, and the connect specifies the only nodes that we want to connect to. Then there is a server parameter that specifies if we uh, want to run Bitcoin, for example, as a user, if I want to just access my wallet, or if I want to uh, create an app with Bitcoin, if I want to have the demo running so I can make API calls and so on. It's a very important parameter because it's a parameter that specifies if you are a developer or not, basically. And then the, uh, the parameter that specifies the fee you want to pay uh, for each transaction. It's like when you are doing transaction with Bitcoin, you have to pay a tax. It's not like um, the tax you pay in banks, right? Because uh, it's a tax that you pay for the transactions to be fasted. I mean, you can, you can, you can not pay a fee, but transactions will be slower, like maybe 20 minutes or so to verify. Uh, it is considered that a transaction is, is safe when six nodes verify the transaction. So if my computer, another five computers, for example, verify the transaction, it is considered safe. Because if you only have, for example, uh, one node, your computer, you can fake the transaction. Or you have two nodes, for example, this computer and this computer, I could hack the computers to fake the money, to fake the transaction. So six nodes is the, is the standard for a transaction to be verified. So if you pay a fee, transactions are really, really fast. If you do not pay, it's like they are fast, but not that fast. Um, then there are other parameters, for example, RPC user. There is, well, you know, all the parameters to connect to your server because, uh, for example, if you want to, like, uh, expose Bitcoin uh, in that port, in that, um, you know, if you want to use a secure socket layer and so on. So uh, the parameters you specify there will be the parameters you need to then connect with your client. So this is the server. You specify the other parameters, the user, the password, the port, and then from the client, you will need to enter that parameters to authenticate in the wallet. Uh, allow IP, for example, is the IP you allow to, to, you allow to connect it to the wallet, to the server. Uh, it's very useful because, for example, if I have, uh, if I have my um, Bitcoin wallet, if I'm building an application, for example, in the cloud, and I have my Bitcoin wallet in uh, one server, and I have my wallet in other server, for example, I will specify there the, the IP of my server where the, running, where the application is running, so only my application uh, can access the wallet. So it's more secure, just that. Then, well, more uh, secure stuff and so on. And then the key pool, for example, uh, is not about development. It's another parameter that is completely separate. So uh, that's the quantity of public or private key or addresses you want to generate uh, or pre-generate. So uh, it's very useful to create a new address each time you want to receive a payment. Like, for example, uh, I want to be totally anonymous, so I create a new address uh, for, for, for every one of you, so you can pay me to different addresses. And you will not associate me to one address, but to a hundred address, for example, addresses. So, so there is like, it's because Bitcoin is not, uh, it's not like 100% anonymous. It's like it is anonymous, but you have to, um, for example, to use more than one address. Because if you use only one address, uh, when, when, ac when accessing the blockchain, the blockchain is the, um, is the storage, is the, is, the, is the place where all the transactions are stored. So if you access the blockchain and search for my address, you will see every transaction I have made. And that's very dangerous. Because, uh, well, you cannot associate my address to me because uh, the address doesn't have my name, obviously. It's only a string. But for more uh, anonymity, what is done is just to use more addresses. So for each time uh, you want to receive a payment, you generate a new address. It's very easy. And then this is, this is the funny part, I think. Uh, well, this is Python, because uh, I think it's really easy to understand the code in Python. And this is basically uh, a script that 
connects to a Bitcoin server, like we saw before, Bitcoin in this case. This is what connects to the server. And then uh, when it receives a Bitcoin transaction, it gives the money back. So if you run this script, for example, and you send some money to your Bitcoin wallet, uh, this script will automatically send back the money you send to this, uh, to this address or to your wallet. It's a very easy script, but I like it because uh, it has all the main um, methods you need to get started with Bitcoin. For example, the first one is the one that connects to the server. As I said before, for example, uh, here in the wallet, in the connect to the wallet in the line four, you are connecting to the server with the parameters you specified uh, there. So the parameters you have there are the parameters you have to put later when connecting to the server. It's really easy. Uh, then I'm getting a new address, a new Bitcoin address. As I said, it is uh, very easy to get new addresses in Bitcoin. You have like billions or trillions of, of addresses to get, so that's not a problem. Then I'm getting the balance, the, the Bitcoins I have in my account or, or in my wallet. You can have uh, different accounts on a single wallet. So you can actually have, for example, 100 users using a single wallet because you can split the wallet by accounts. That's very useful when you are running um, a cloud service, for example, in which you need to, to manage payments with Bitcoin, but you don't want to have a single wallet, a single server running for every single user. That would be crazy. I mean, a single server for each user is like you have to, you know, to have running a lot of processes, uh, a lot of ports, and so on. So what you do is just to split the wallet on various accounts. One account for each user. So each account has its own addresses and its own log of transactions. It's really easy to work with it. So then I'm listing the last 10 transactions that have been done. And then I just uh, check if the transaction has been confirmed. Um, as I said, like six confirmations is the, is the standard for this. Um, there are also like what they call green address. A green address is an address that is trusted. For example, uh, an address that comes from a famous exchange. There are Bitcoin exchanges such as NTGOX or Bitstam, that maybe you know. It's obvious that this exchange will not uh, fake the transaction because they are you know, popular exchanges and that will ruin their reputation. So there are green addresses that uh, you can have in a list. Uh, if, if the address that is sending you money is between the list of green addresses, of addresses you trust, you can just uh, skip that, don't verify the number of confirmations, and trust the transaction. In this case, in the case of um, having a green address send you money, for example, if NTGOX is sending me money, and I verify that NTGOX uh, has an address that is uh, a green address, it could be seconds what it lasts for a transaction to, to be verified, to, to be notified to me. But it's really recommendable when, when, when not, when not um, doing transaction with a change or win addresses to verify transactions. Because there is something called double, double, double spend in Bitcoin. Double spend consists of an attack in which uh, someone hacks various computers to actually uh, fake a transaction to fake that the guy has money, but he hasn't. Because like I said before, um, this is all about nodes. So if you, if you got, for example, a error of nodes that confirm your transaction, it may be fake, but the transaction will confirm, uh, and I will accept your money. Uh, there is also an attack in Bitcoin that is the 51% um, attack. That is that if, the, if for example, uh, has changed or, or or someone gets the 51% of the Bitcoin networks. I mean, if there are, for example, uh, a lot of you know a lot of PCs running Bitcoin, as and someone has the um, like the 51% of that computers, they will verify all their transactions. And they will control the network. Uh, that happens as well with any other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. It's very common. Uh, and then in the last line, I use. Uh, I just send back the money. 
As you see, it is very easy to work with Bitcoin. And it's also pretty fast because when, you know, as we are uh, working with RPC and, and JSON, for example, this API is, is, is JSON. Well, I'm using a library that is Bitcoin RPC. There is like an um, uh, RPC library, but it's really adapted to Bitcoin. You can use Bitcoin Daemon with any RPC library, with any uh, JSON RPC library. But this library is just adapted to work with Bitcoin, so you have all the methods there. I'm really sure easy to work with it. Yeah, as, as you see, it is uh, a synchronous API because what it does, it, it sends a command, an RPC command over JSON to the Bitcoin daemon. And then the Bitcoin daemon does the work. So the work is not, is not done here. The work is done on the daemon. Now we are connected to the daemon and controlling the daemon from here and the whole world from here. So uh, now, jumping from the developer uh, perspective, that as you see, uh, developing with Bitcoin is really easy. I want to talk about some points about Bitcoin that are uh, maybe a bit risky. And when you are creating an application that works with Bitcoin, you have to think about this. Because if you do not think about this, uh, they will like attack you, hack you. Um, you know, what is it later? Uh, before, sorry. Uh, fake transactions. And fake that they have money, that the users have money, pay you, you will accept the payment, but then your money will not be valid. So, so this is very important. Uh, well, first of all, in the world we live, we can actually reverse a lot of transactions. For example, when you pay something with your uh, credit card, you have, I think, in Europe, it's one week to, to reverse the transaction, to just uh, call your bank and say that you did not uh, that transaction, for example, and they will get your money back. The thing happens in PayPal, for example. In PayPal, uh, if, someone, if you pay someone, but the, that person that that sold you the goods does not deliver them, you can uh, just reverse the transaction. I have it as well in, in the United States with the HCH uh, transactions, that are like bank wire transactions that can be reversed in two days. But Bitcoin is not that way. Bitcoin is reversible. It's, it's, it's reversible, yeah. It's, it's just one way. I mean, you cannot get back your money when you pay. You just pay and your money is there. You cannot get back it. And that's something really important, for example, when create a marketplace with Bitcoin. On the one hand, it's a problem because the user is not that productive. If the, if the user um, pays for something um, and that person doesn't deliver that good to, to, to the buyer, there is a huge problem in that. But on the other hand, it is really cool because uh, there are billions, there is an industry of billions of euros in, um, for example, buying credit cards and then uh, buying digital goods with them and reversing the transaction. It happens a lot. For example, there are some, uh, there are some websites that try to sell Bitcoin online. Uh, so you can buy them with a credit card. The problem is that uh, buying a Bitcoin with a credit card is not, well, it's possible, but it's like giving away your money. Because Bitcoin is one way payment. Uh, credit card is not that way. Credit card, you can reverse the transaction. So, so if I pay, for example, for a Bitcoin using my credit card, I can then call Visa and say, I did not draft that transaction. And they will reverse it. But Bitcoin is not reversible. So if you search, for example, buying Bitcoins with credit card, you will find out that it's uh, impossible to buy Bitcoins with credit card. So you have to buy them, for example, going to exchange or um, sending money to the exchange using a, a wire transaction, a bank transaction, or using other alternative payments, but not with credit card. So think about that. Transactions are only one way. You cannot return your money. Then transactions must be confirmed to be trusted on them. As I said, uh, the standard is six confirmations. It has six nodes verify your transaction. And then transactions can be easily tracked. As I said before, there is a blockchain, there is a, a public log of transactions so if you go there, for example, uh, if you go to blockchain, I think it's blockchain.info. We see, for example, the latest transactions that are happening there in real time, and we see the addresses. So Bitcoin is anonymous in the sense that uh, knowing that address, you cannot know Luis Ivan Quende. 
because the address doesn't have my name or my identification or whatever. But it's not anonymous in the sense that all the transactions are there. So please, each time you want to receive a payment, just generate a new address. There are trillions of, of addresses, so don't worry about that. Yeah, so going back to the slides. Um, now I want to talk about the future of Bitcoin. Uh, it's something I'm very concerned about. Because right now, uh, governments and banks are trying like, to kill Bitcoin. Uh, and I know why. I mean, it is uh, really easy to, to think why governments, for example, don't like Bitcoin. It's because, ta because taxes. Um, governments live uh, using taxes. They just uh, collect taxes for, for their citizens. The problem is that with Bitcoin, there are no taxes. It's all digital. It's all based on the internet. So how a government knows if I have paid my taxes or not? Because it's anonymous. So you cannot really know. Uh, and also banks don't like it because with Bitcoin, you are your own bank. You have your wallet here. For example, I have my wallet. Uh, the wallet looks like uh, Bitcoin, yeah. This is the official client of Bitcoin, as you can see. Uh, so you have here my, my, my Bitcoins. And, I can, and this is like my bank. It's like uh, when you connect to your bank online and you can see your balance, you can send payments, you can receive payments, etc. It's the same here, but it's better because you own the money. You, you have the money here in your laptop. And you lost your wallet, for example, you just have to, to backup it you have the string, the private key, and you are done. So this is, for example, what you cannot see very well, but uh, for example, the recent transactions. And you can, as you can see here, it's the same thing. Why? Because every single node has a blockchain stored. So my wallet is downloading all the transactions that have been made while uh, my wallet was offline. So now that is offline, that, that is online, sorry, it is downloading every single transaction to verify them. So my wallet right now is verifying all their peer transactions. And that was very cool that my, my CPU, my computer power, my computer processing is serving to, to verify other people's transactions and vice versa. So uh, as you see, I can send a payment, for example. Let me just uh, put here the, the address. Uh, I have a lot of address, as you, can, as you can see here. Because generating one is really easy, it's just new address. And you put here the level, you can put the, uh, the level you want. For example, if I, if I were to, to, um, you know, to, to make a business here in Campus Party with someone, I would put here uh, like payment from Campus Party or whatever. And this generates a new address. And I can give that address to the, to the campus party people or whatever, and they can pay me using that address. And you can generate a new one. It's very easy. You can also you know, show a QR code so you can pay with the mobile. It's very common nowadays to have uh, in your mobile phone applications uh, that run on the, like Bitcoin wallets. The same I have here, a Bitcoin wallet you can have in your smartphone, and you can uh, just scan the code um, and do the transactions uh, and, pay, and pay me just scanning this code. It's very easy. What I think I like is that uh, if you use Bitcoin, you are an active user. Like, you scan the code and you put in your smartphone what quantity of Bitcoins you want to pay. It's not the other way. It's not like um, with credit cards. That, for example, with credit cards, someone uh, takes my card, then uses uh, you know, whatever to, to scan it. And then uh, they put the money I, I want to, or, or they want to, to ask me for. So in Bitcoin, is more active. You, the, the, the buyer, the, the one that, that creates a transaction, you are the one that, that puts the quantity of, of money you want to send to the other one. This is a lot of transactions. As you see, they are all verified. But let's create a new one, for example. Um, I'm going to copy this address. I'm going to pay to, I'm going to pay myself uh, because, uh, well, I can create another, another wallet, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I can. So this is another Bitcoin client. There are like 
10 Bitcoin clients or so, because it's free software. So what I would do is uh, I would copy my address here, and I will do a live payment. So uh, I send Bitcoins to my other address. Um, this is like a message you can leave here. So I can put, yeah, whatever, uh, campus party. And I will spend zero, yeah, zero to five bitcoins. There is also a, conver a conversion here. So you can see that zero to five bitcoins are actually right now uh, 75 dollars. And you can send a drug sanction. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And then it will appear here. Yeah, here it is. Well, I think I, I made a payment to myself, but yeah, whatever. Uh, so uh, the problem with centralized exchange, going back to the, to, the, to the future of Bitcoin, is that empty gox are bit stamped, they are the main exchanges right now, control the 80% of the Bitcoin volume. So if you want to buy or sell Bitcoins for uh, fiat currency, for dollars, for euros, you need to use an exchange, and they are centralized. Bitcoin is peer-to-peer, -peer, but they are centralized. So it is really for governments and banks to, to kill that, to kill that companies that exchange Bitcoin for dollars or, or euros. And it has been uh, happening for a while now. Actually, some, year, some days ago, a trade hill that is a famous US exchange was closed. Uh, like a year ago or some months ago, Bitcoin24, that, that was the um, uh, third or, or, yeah, I think the third most famous exchange was closed as well. Because banks and governments don't like this. So, as I'm very worried with the future of Bitcoin, I'm creating something new to fix that. To save Bitcoin and to, you know, to create a peer-to-peer -peer exchange so we can actually uh, not depend on a single centralized exchange such as MTGO or Bitstamp. So, some days ago or, or, or some weeks, I don't remember when I have the idea, but, but I thought about POV. POV is the world's first peer-to-peer -peer exchange in the sense that um, when, when you use a centralized exchange, for example, um, and I wanna, let's see, I wanna buy Bitcoins with empty ghosts. That is the most popular exchange right now. So I have to send my money to the empty ghost bank account. Then when the, when the, when empty ghost receives my money, they update my balance and I then can trade. Can say, okay, I'm gonna uh, put a buy trade. So I'm gonna um, buy one Bitcoins at the price of, uh, I don't know, um, $100 a Bitcoin. And then you receive the Bitcoins and you have to move your Bitcoins from your uh, empty ghost account to your wallet. So in a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, that doesn't work that way. It's really, it's, it's really easy, and it's easier than with a, a centralized exchange. So I just give a couple uh, data, for example, my uh, payment processor, uh, my, my, my fiat money, my, my traditional currency wallet, when I want to receive my money. And let's see, I'm selling Bitcoins. So, for example, if I'm selling Bitcoins, I just have to uh, give a couple data. And then my data is sent to a server that is secure. And that server um, is also with other buy and sell orders. So it doesn't match in. So if I want to buy one Bitcoin uh, at the price of um, 100 euros, for example, another person wants to sell one Bitcoin at the same price, it does the matching and intercambiates, uh, exchange the Bitcoin. Uh, and the, and the money. So I'm really proud of, of, of having this here. I have been uh, preparing this just uh, before my talk. And I will just put here a small video to show you how it works. I don't know if audio is working, but, but it's not working, but uh, you will figure out. It's what I just explained here. This is what uh, a centralized exchange look, looks like. For buying Bitcoins, I, I have to send my money to the bank account of the exchange. Then the exchange will receive my money. Uh, it's now, I think. Yeah. And then, for example, other peer wants to sell Bitcoins, and that's the same. Sends Bitcoins to the, to the stock wallet, and then the wallet uh, has the Bitcoins, and then does the match. But with a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, it is like exactly. Uh, let's skip that. Yeah, it's like 
is like this. It's pretty easy, and there is not a central bank account. There is not uh, a central wallet. So if a government or, or a bank wants to kill this, it is impossible. It's a Bitcoin. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. You have to kill every single node. And that's not possible. So I'm very excited about this. And, um, and you can, I have just opened here the Indiegogo campaign. And I hope it goes well and, and it helps, you know, saving Bitcoin. And, you know, I think Bitcoin is something that is worth. And, and I think it will have a very interesting future if we keep it peer to peer, if we do not let the banks and governments kill it. So that's it. Uh, thank you. If you have any question. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you just want to pop your hands in the air. Any questions? Hi, um, I've got a few questions. How many people actually use Bitcoin? Um, I don't really know how many people use it because it's impossible to know. But uh, I know the volume, for example. Um, the whole Bitcoin network right now has a value of uh, one billion and a half, I think, dollars. So it is impossible to know the number of people that are using it. But what I know is, for example, that in the, in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, they use a lot of Bitcoin and you can pay in restaurants with Bitcoin and so on. Uh, also in some places of Africa, they are starting to use it. But I don't know the numbers because it is anonymous and it can't be known. So if I were to, if I had like say 100 computers and I only need six of them to verify a transaction, that means I could hack the server and since it's anonymous, there's absolutely no way of people find out, finding out it was me. I can buy I, all sorts of things, and I have no guarantee that I'm going to receive anything because there's, ab there's no way of being able to tell who the seller was. Yeah. So yeah. how is that e safe for people to use it, you know? Yeah, I get your point. Yeah, um, well, it is almost impossible to control the network and to have. For example, um, the connections are usually made random between peers. So uh, you cannot actually like, have a cluster of peers verifying your fake transactions. And if you have, for example, uh, I mean, you, you, you can have 100 computers uh, fake transactions. Problem is that the network is much bigger. And when one peer of outside, for example, uh, connects to your, to your node, to one of your nodes, it will see your fake transaction. But when it connects to other nodes that is outside your network, it will see that that transaction does, does not exist. So it's like the network is so big that it's impossible to actually have a cluster of millions of computers uh, trying to hack it and, and faking that. So that's it. I mean, uh, but, but yeah, if you, if you, for example, um, make a like a proxy in this network and redirect all the Bitcoin traffic of my machine to your cluster of servers, then you can hack it. Yeah. Why would I want to use Bitcoin if I have no guarantee of... You mean? It's not safe. Well, it is safe. But, for example, say I buy something on eBay or... Yeah using PayPal or whatever, and I pay somebody, I, bought, I buy something, I pay them, and I don't receive anything, yeah. then I know I'm not losing any money. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, so why, uh, why would I use Bitcoin if I can just use normal money where I have some sort of safety or guarantee? Yeah, I understand your point. Yeah, I mean, um, scroll services are made for, for that case, for example. So there are some scroll services. What, what the scroll services does, that, uh, so it's like um, you send your money to the scroll service. Uh, the other person sends the good, send, send what, what you purchase to the to the scroll. And when the scroll has the two, uh, the money and the product, the scroll just change them to their so owners. Th it's not peer to peer then. There's somebody in the middle. Uh, well, somebody in the middle is required to do certain things. Yeah. Bitcoin is like a framework, I think. It's not a product. It's like a framework in which you can build uh, on top of that. But I don't think it's a finished product. So yeah, you can build an escrow service. Uh, well, you can build also a peer-to-peer escrow service. 
Uh, Everything can be peer to peer. A um, few more questions. What do you think about uh, there's other alternatives to Bitcoin, such as Litecoin, I think it's yeah, called? Yeah, Litecoin. Um, why are there, if Bitcoin is the solution to many problems, why would, the, why would there be any alternatives? And yeah. also, what do you think about the possibility of mining Bitcoin? Because people used to think that you could actually make some money out of it, but yeah. it really, it, there's no, it's not profitable anymore. So just what you think about that? Yeah, well, uh, starting with the mining question, uh, I think if you have some uh, very new hardware, for example, if you are a producer uh, from China and you, you, are, you are creating hardware, and you are the one that is creating the chips from China, for example, uh, you can start mining because your hardware is, 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 is better than your hardware. But what happens is that uh, the ones that create the chips, for example, in China, uh, start mining in China with their own chips. So when the chips are sold to, for example, the Europeans, the chips are not that new because they have, used for, they have been used for mining uh, in China. So it, it is like uh, if you can um, have the newest hardware, you can have very low, uh, a very high profit. If you can't, uh, it's not profitable at all. Uh, well, the, other the other question was about, uh, yeah, Litecoin, uh, other alternatives, yeah. Uh, well, I think Bitcoin has got so, so traction, I mean, so much traction, there is, uh, that looking at other alternatives just, uh, I don't think, I don't think is the, is the important part, I mean. Uh, it's free software, so Litecoin, for example, is a fork of Bitcoin uh, that has some, uh, well, they see improvements. I think they are not that uh, improvement, but but I think Bitcoin has got so many traction that it's impossible to to just switch to other virtual currency. Well, if Bitcoin fails for any reason, for example, uh, imagine that the cryptography mechanism it uses is cracked, then we can switch to the currency. But right now, it would be stupid to switch to the currency because of the traction that Bitcoin has got. Any more questions? Yes. Obviously, you tackled the um, sort of issue with the ASIC miners. Um, obviously, they're a considerable value con compared to using a GPU with CUDA as t in regards to price and price of electricity used into producing the, the bits in the pool, say, uh, or, or independent solo, whatever your rig is. Um, but how long and, and how possible, do, if you know it, do you think uh, it will happen to Litecoin? Because Litecoin is supposed to be sort of a bit more resistant with the algorithm used by scripts, apparently. I've heard. Uh, you mean, uh, I don't listen. You I've do said, well, uh, I said basically, uh, uh, how long do you think they'll come? How long will it take, do you think, before an ASIC miner comes up before uh, Litecoin? Uh, you mean like, uh, if I think Litecoin is more secure? No, just, just, just take, for example, the ASIC uh, chip, the USB chip, uh, before those dongles start coming out for Litecoin, you know. Yeah. And then we move on to the next currency. Then, then what will happen to the next currency, you know? Uh, you mean, what, what do you think will happen to Litecoin in the future? Yeah. Like, yeah um, I just mm. think that people always go for the easiest thing. That's what my personal view is. <laughs> you know what I mean? To mine, so. Yeah. Well, I think, I think uh, somebody is, is, is like... Uh, a lot of people is comparing Bitcoin to gold and Litecoin to, to silver. And I think it will stay that way. Uh, Litecoin is the, is the like, cheaper alternative and Bitcoin is the, is the main currency. So I think it will stay that way. And we had a question over this side. Hello, uh, I'm a big lover and fan of all these P2P projects, peer-to-peer, -peer, and I actually like very much Bitcoin, but if I try to explain this to my mother, for example, she's going to say me that I'm fucking crazy. So I would like to know if there is some kind of project to, uh, to approach these kind of things, to, uh, and in this case, Bitcoin, yes. to mainstream people. Yes, um, I'm working on a startup to solve that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is like a... A POF is the, is the first step to, like, to fix Bitcoin, to fix the future of Bitcoin. And then the next step is my startup that I'm working right now. That is like uh, making it easier for the people to use Bitcoin. So yeah, uh, stay tuned and in the next months I will announce something really cool regarding to that. It's a good question. Yeah.
Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering, I was thinking uh, in Spain, uh, because of the economical crisis, there was a lot of initiative about creating uh, local currencies, which are obviously not recognized by the government. I was recalling, for instance, I think it was in Seville, this uh, Puma. Uh, is there any social component in, in Bitcoin or any in initiative about that? Um, I think, well, in the technology itself, there is no social component because the, uh, Bitcoin is totally anonymous. So the technology itself is like a platform you can build on top of that. For example, in my next startup, I'm doing a social layer on top of Bitcoin to fix that, that Bitcoin is not social by default. But I think it is cool that Bitcoin is not social by default because uh, if it, were, if it, if it were, was social, it would be not anonymous. So I prefer that it's like a very, very basic platform to build on top of that. I think that Bitcoin is an API to the financial system. It's not a product. It's like an API to hack money. But there are already initiatives around this idea of... Uh, because Ooh. the idea with this was uh, yes. remove the money from the system and little by little the local coin will be more yeah. powerful. Is there any kind of initiative yeah, like this built in the top of uh, uh, Bitcoin? As I said, for example, uh, in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, they are doing a lot of uh, movement with Bitcoin, a lot of noise with Bitcoin. Uh, because, you know, for example, there are a couple of startups there in the Silicon Valley and and you know, uh, they start out very, very like when, bis when Bitcoin was born, and they started accepting Bitcoin in some restaurants and bars. So, so they are the first; they are the pioneers there in the Silicon Valley. But yeah, I think we will expand in other countries. For example, in Spain, with our uh, high taxes, I think it will start uh, growing because it is not cool to pay like a lot of taxes that we do in Spain, for example. That there are taxes for every single, uh, you know every single thing you pay. So I think Bitcoin will expand and will, will create a social movement, yeah. Um, may I ask the difference between the uh, website you've got up there and like other websites that do peer-to-peer, -peer, such as local Bitcoin? Uh, you mean like uh, other, other sites? Uh, yeah, well, like local Bitcoin does peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Oh, yeah, but that's it's different between, uh, because um, when doing this talk, it's a, it's, a, it's a trading platform. A trading platform is something that works in uh, milliseconds. It's very fast. Local Bitcoins, for example, uh, I'm going to go to local Bitcoins so you can see what he's talking about. Local Bitcoins is a way to uh, buy Bitcoins uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer way. The problem is that it's on a, a trading platform and prices, for example, are higher. This is a trading platform. This works in real time. Uh, local Bitcoin, well, you have to make a bank transfer, for example, or meet uh, locally with the other peer. Um, POV is not that way. You use uh, do it online, online and real time. So you're like a trading platform doing peer-to-peer. -peer. I think a trading platform is something uh, that every single currency uh, must do. And if it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's better, obviously. Oh, no, no. This is totally non-profit and free software. So no fees, uh, totally free software. You can install in your own server, in your own node. So yeah, no fees at all. This is non-profit. Yeah, I understand your point. So, um, what is peer-to-peer -peer is, the, is the system. I mean, is that uh, I send the money to other peer without a central bank account. The program itself, the code itself, is not peer-to-peer. -peer. It's free software, it's like federated, but it's not peer-to-peer -peer exactly. So wh what's peer-to-peer -peer is that uh, I send my money or my bitcoins uh, from one peer to one peer without a central bank account or exchange. But the code itself is not peer-to-peer. -peer because uh, if it were peer-to-peer, -peer, it, it would be uh, not real-time. So that's, yeah. All right, That's thank it. you very much. Sorry, we'll have to cut you there. But um, thanks so much, yeah. Louis, for your really insightful thank talk you. on Bitcoin. A round of applause for Louis Van Quende. <laughs> and um, on the O2 main stage, we have David Rowan, who will be um, speaking there. So thank you. And back the project, please.